Good morning. Good morning. Scripture lesson today is taken from Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, 1 through 11. Philippians 1, 1 through 11. Philippians 1, 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and priest, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think, thank my God, with all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I told you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and with all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the free fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Thus endeth the reading of God's holy word. May it bless its truth to our hearts, and may we be in prayer with God. Let's pray. Father God, we, we bow humbly in thy presence today, knowing, Father, how great and how powerful and how good you are and knowing how bad and how evil we are. Father, forgive us our sins, our many sins. Wish us and make us as clean as the new fall of snow that we might be worthy to be in your kingdom. Father, we thank thee for the love that you have for each of us. The love that you had for us that you sent your only begotten Son into the world that he should die in our place. For this, our Father, we're eternally grateful. Father, we thank thee for the opportunities that you give us in life, for the opportunities we have to pass on the love that you gave unto us to others round about us. Father, as, as we come together on this beautiful Lord's Day, we thank you for the sunshine, but we also thank you for the rain, our Father, for without the rain, nothing can grow. But with the sunshine, it looks so good and it feels so good, and Father, we're just thankful that it is sunshine. We thank you for our Father that you are near to us, that you're just a prayer away, that we can talk to you anytime, day or night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And Father, for that, we are eternally grateful. Father, we ask thy blessing upon each one here, and especially on those who would like to be here and not able. Father, we pray for the Kenny Ebert family. We pray our 
offer that you will comfort them as only you can at a time like this. Be with them and comfort them and let you let them know that you are present and that you are there for them. Father, we, we thank thee for this great nation that we live in. We pray, our Father, that someday we will be back to one nation under God. Father, we thank you for our great military that keeps us safe. We pray that you will keep them safe and keep them strong, that they will be able to protect us and keep us safe and free as we are today. Father, we just ask that you be with us day in and day out. May our, our footprints be like the footprints in the sand where someone said, where were you when we only had one track of footprints? And, and God said, well, that's when I carried you. And Father, we know that. We know that. And we, we, we appreciate it. And we thank you for doing it. Father, we ask you to bless each of us as we bow humbly in thy presence today. We ask you now, our Father, to be with us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to thee, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. When he was 88 years old, the late Supreme Court Justice Oliver Holmes once found himself on a train. And when the conductor came by, Oliver Holmes couldn't find his ticket. And he seemed terribly upset. He searched all these pockets. He searched his wallet. He just searched everything he had. And he could not find his train ticket. Finally, the conductor says, well, don't worry, Mr. Holmes. The Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to trust the Supreme Court Justice. After you reach your destination, you can take your ticket and you can mail it to us. That'll be fine. The conductor's kindness did not put Mr. Holmes at ease. Still agitated, he said, My dear man, my problem is not where is my ticket. The problem is, where am I going? I don't know about you, but there certainly have been moments in my journey of faith when I've asked myself, how in the world did I get myself in such a mess? What wrong turn did I make? Where am I supposed to be going? We have uh, a saying we picked up from Bugs Bunny when we get lost or something. We said, well, we must have made a wrong turn in Albuquerque. Right, Kelly? Mm -hmm. We got that from Bugs Bunny years and years ago. And sometimes I think we did <laughs> make a wrong turn somewhere. we choose to paint the picture of our lives in these moments when we are unsure of our direction whether we will be a victim or whether we will be a victor the colors that we choose determine whether we will quit when the, we reach the first roadblock and detour that comes upon us or whether we have the courage and commitment to go the extra mile and distance to reach our destination. Yes, how indebted we are to those radiant individuals like Joni Erickson, Chuck Colson, who brought a perspective of hope and courage into the difficult circumstances they found themselves suddenly immersed into. 
what will grab our attention and help us to focus our life's direction? Will it be energy and enthusiasm? Or will it be discouragement and disillusionment? Will it be faith fueled by the Holy Spirit or the flames of fear and futility? It seems that so many people who start the faith journey with a great bolt of lightning fade quickly from the headlines like the headlines of the newspaper. What happens to these fellow pros on the road of life? What happens if they run head-on, unexpected detours, dead in alleys, rugged roadblocks? They become disappointed, disillusioned, depressed, defeated. They raise their hands in despair and they turn around and go home. They experience hardships or are ridiculed or receive unwarranted criticism and attack which turn their dreams into nightmares. Can you identify with any of these circumstances that I have mentioned here today? How have you allowed them to color your life? Now you find yourself in church in the silence of these few moments. Your soul cries out with anguish and hurt. Is there any word from the Lord for me? I'm very glad that you asked that question. For our Bible is packed full with pages of faithful biblical characters who traveled on the road of life before us and who also experienced broken dreams, crippling roadblocks, major disappointments that seemed to have the tenacity of a junkyard dog. Do not give in. Do not give up ever. There is hope for our lives. Today I want to share with you the story of one of the God's finest servants and role models for our lives who could overcome broken dreams, difficult moments, and numerous times in life when it seemed that he was going in the wrong direction. I think you could safely say that Paul is certainly no stranger when it comes to life's setbacks, life's detours, life's dead-end alleys. This scripture lesson was not written from the Hilton Tower in Rome, but from a dingy prison cell. It might both shock and surprise you today that about one-third of the New Testament was written from various jail cells. Imagine how these various moments of great difficulty could have colored, they could have colored Paul's life in the most detrimental ways. However, however, instead of quitting, like many people do when life deals a harsh hand, Paul declares, I count it all joy. Now, can you imagine that? That's faith. He knew he might be down, but he was never, ever counted out. The difference between an admirer of Christ and a faith-filled servant of Jesus Christ is how we handle the pressures of life and how we allow them to color our lives. Christians are those who can cope with the changing circumstances of life because of the presence of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in our lives. 
I want to give you today three ways to respond when you seem to be going in the wrong direction in life. First of all, keep the dream alive. Now the word dream is in Webster's Dictionary. And one of the many meanings for the word dream is to have a fond hope or aspiration or to think of something noble in life. Yes, dreams are hopes and ideas that inspire us and that motivate us. Dreams can be the most powerful persuasive force that work in our world. Dreams of freedom and religious liberties propel countless peoples to move across oceans and unknown lands. As long as the dream is alive, so are the people who pursue them. Never underestimate the power of an idea. I can't believe you can explain the recent changes in our world without the power of dreams and the people who claim and shape them. How else can we explain how an unknown shipyard electrician in Poland could begin to sustain a movement of reformation in his native land, a movement they tried to crush and control but without success. You look at Walt Leck Wallace and you see a dreamer. For years they tried to beat down and even imprison the dreams of Leck Wallace. The Polish regime soon learned that you cannot imprison dreams behind locked doors and iron bars. If dreams are from God, they are too powerful to be caged and shackled. God takes a nun from the safe environment of a school teacher and uses her dream and visions to be the leading spokesman for the cause of the helpless, the hopeless, the homeless persons in the world. Mother Teresa was a dreamer. Her dreams propelled her into the world to be the salt and the light and the leaven for the kingdom of God. Her dreams were so fueled and so fueled the flames of her witness. What kind of ideas and dreams do you entertain in your very being today. How do these ideas and dreams move and inspire your activities today and in the future? How do these dreams and ideas measure up to God's dreams and visions for our world and for our shared life as a community of faith? The dreams of our forefathers and foremothers prepared, propelled them across the oceans and continents. How will we respond to the dreams and visions that God is placing upon our hearts and, and to claim a new territory for the King of Kings? According to recent statistics, 57% of the population in any given area is unchurched. And I think that number has gone up greatly now. As the church, we need to respond to the crisis, to the cries of God's people when they ask, is there any word from the Lord today? As God's people, we are always pilgrims on a journey to answer the call of God. Yes, God always offers a larger, greater, 
grander dream and hope for the fellowship of the redeemed than the secular world will ever offer. God has promised that if we are faithful in his leading, he will guarantee a harvest in due time, even when the weeds grow side by side with the wheat. All we need is faith to respond. Yes, keep on dreaming even when your dreams have been shattered, broken, or temporarily put on hold by the roadblocks of life. Remember the words of Oscar Hammerstein and Richard Rogers who penned these famous words. Climb every mountain, search high and low, follow every byway, every path you know. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. Keep your dream alive. This is one key when it comes to when it seems that you have lost your direction of journey in life. Secondly, don't let the detours of life prevent you from making the full journey of life. Do not be afraid of the longer way around. God sometimes leads us the longer way. The obvious thing to go to the promised land from Egypt was by the way of the sea. Instead, God sent his people south when they needed to go northeast. God often sends his people the longer way. David went the longer way to the throne. Paul went the longer way to Rome. Why does God lead the longer way? Well, the longer way is sometimes the safer way. Sometimes God has to teach us to say no to some lesser dreams in order to say yes to a greater and more challenging dream. Often when we fail, God is just beginning to do his finest work with us. When we fail, God doesn't throw us into a jump heap, but now is ready to mold us and to shape us for a greater work than we can ever imagine. The church is for the broken. Isn't it amazing that detours can be one way that a sovereign God leads us, guides us, provides for us? There is no part or effect in our lives that can't be used by the church and by God. That's good news for those of us gathered here today. If the church is founded on Peter, it is founded on the second choice. Third, to follow our dreams, we must have the determination to run the good race. I love the story about the 10 year old boy that went to baseball camp to improve the skills of the game that he really loved. And he came home and he was anxious to show his dad. He took his dad down to the park. He took the ball up and threw it up in the air and he swung at it and his dad felt the air off of it. But the ball just hit the ground. Second time, he threw it up in the air and took a big cut at it, missed it, and the ball fell to the ground. Third time, he threw it up, took a big cut at it, missed it, and the ball fell to the ground. He said, Dad, when I was at summer camp, I determined to be the greatest pitcher in the world, and you can see how I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like that story. I believe the question before us today is not whether we will have roadblocks in life, but how will we react when 
no throat blocks come. When we run away from them, will we quit? Or will we become more determined than ever to reach for our dreams and our goals in life? Once a man heard that 80% of all traffic accidents happened within one mile of home, what did he do? He moved. <laughs> yeah. Roadblocks come in every life. In a book titled Death Comes to the Archbishop, a young priest scolds an older priest for going out in bad weather on an errand of mercy without the proper warm clothing on. The young man says, well, you will catch your death of cold. And the old priest smiles and says, when I die, it will not be of cold, but it will be from having lived. That captures perfectly the spirit of determination that we need as we labor and love and live for our Lord. I've been amazed at the various people who have been imprisoned in history and how they have used that experience in prison. Adolf Hitler used his time in prison to write his famous book in which he espoused the radical hatred and violence that resulted in great human destruction around the world. John Bunyan was in prison in England when he wrote the famous Christian classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, in which he so beautifully describes his experience of the grace of God. Finally, we have the sacred writing of the Apostle Paul. In jail, he used his time as a sabbatical leave and wrote a letter to a church that he founded and that he dearly loved. He writes the letter to express his thanks and joy for the remembrance of him and the gift brought to him by Ephroditus. He sends Ephroditus back with this letter of thanks, which we know as the letters to the Philippians. It is called the Joy Book of the Bible. Yes, Paul found a joy which not even iron bars or Roman chains could deter or imprison. The impact of that joy produces a determination for life determination for life, which results in Paul's great declaration, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is not the cry of a victim, but that is the cry of a victor. The apostle knew that there is nothing one can do to prevent the advent of adversity and deter. A servant is never above his master. We can, however, through the presence of our master, control completely what adversary does to us. It can do almost anything else to us that we allow it to do to us. It can wreck us or it can enable us. We are called to keep our eyes on Jesus. We do not know what tomorrow holds, but we know this, and we know him who holds tomorrow. He who holds all tomorrows in his hands. Dr. Charles Stanley often calls to his memory the incident in his life which an unlikely person shared a biblical truth and principle that he has never forgotten. It still provides bread for the journey. Dr. Stanley was at a time of turmoil and opposition in one of the churches that he served. And a dear lady, who only had a small apartment, 
invited him for dinner. He reluctantly agreed to go. He wasn't sure that he wanted to or not. After all, this wasn't the head of the Deacon Board or president of the Fortune 500, but an elderly lady who had turned out to be a living saint. He reluctantly went, expecting to, her to give him an old-fashioned tongue lashing, and she said, Pastor, look at this picture and tell me what you see. He looked at the picture and saw it was a famous picture of Daniel standing in the lion's den. He described a few other details, and then he became quiet. She said, Pastor, is there anything else? He said, no, I don't think so. She lovingly placed, placed, placed her arm around his waist and said, Pastor, what I wanted you to see and never forget is this. Daniel does not have his eyes on the lion. His eyes are focused on Jesus Christ. Paul knew his eyes in that prison cell should not be focused on the cell wall, but on Jesus Christ. Yes, there's life's direction. There's times in going through life's way. We sometimes think maybe we're going the wrong way, and sometimes we are. But sometimes we, we just need to remember Remember, do not become bitter, but do get better. Be a victor, not a victim. Don't let your dreams fade. Keep your dreams alive. Don't quit. You keep on keeping on. Run the good race. Keep your eyes focused and fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ and everything will work out. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are our Father and that we are, can come to you in prayer at any time. Father, help us to take the example that the lady in the story told and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He will never steer us wrong. He will always lead us straight. Father, we thank you that you did send your son into this world that he should die for us and bear our sins away because we can't bear it alone. Father, we ask you to bless each one here and help us to keep our dreams alive and help us to keep following you all the days of our life. For it is in Christ's holy name that I pray. Amen.